Yeah, today I'm here to talk to you about declarative programming. And after an Eric's perfect introduction, I really don't have to introduce myself anymore, it seems. Um, but I've been working with Rust since early 2014, and I've been loving every minute of it. Uh, right now, I'm mostly concerned with making CLI tools in Rust really amazing. And also, if you happen to be in Cologne, you should come to Ramida. You can find me on the, on the internet on these addresses. And with that, let's start at the beginning. The very, very beginning. What is a computer program? Let's think about that for a minute. Now, okay, fine. So to make a program work, you basically have to tell a computer what to do, step by step. Step by very tiny step. So this is imperative. This is literally called imperative programming. And if you do enough of this, it's uh, very hard to reason about the general behavior of your program. But you might be saying, well, this is Rustfest, not assembly camp. So what are you even talking about? If you're here for assembly, this is not a talk for you, I'm so sorry. Uh, but a common theme with my talks is that I'll at some point drift off and talk about what maintainable code looks like. And as always, having maintainable code is in high uh, demand, but uh, it's also very hard to get there. So the question you need to ask yourself, is my code maintainable? And this is a good question, and I have some more questions. First off, like, how much do you need to read to understand what is going on? But also, how much do you need to write to make a change in your program code? And last but not least, how easy is it to identify the core concepts of what's going on? These are very generic questions, I know. And they apply to basically every piece of code you've ever written, I think. So what does it actually have to do with this talk? Because the talk is declarative programming. So let's define this. And as always, when I need to find the definition of something, I go to Wikipedia, and Wikipedia tells me that the cloud of program is often defined as any style of programming that is not imperative. <laughs> that's, that's true. OK, but not really helpful. Um, the Wikipedia page goes on and talks about some examples for the cloud of programming. For example, HTML, or regular expressions, or SQL but also Haskell and Prolog. Helpful, yeah? Okay, okay, fine. But what is it really about? Uh, I'd summarize it as it's about the what instead of the how. The idea is that you don't write all the steps on how to get somewhere, but instead you try to express what you want to accomplish and basically have your computer do stuff for you which is nice. And you might be wondering how. OK, so a few steps you might want to take is to identify concepts that your program is about, and you try to extract their behavior. You abstract over control flow. That means you have in your editor, with syntax highlighting, less of those colorful keywords and more expressive function names. And in the end, you hope to be able to compose your application from smaller parts. OK, OK, fine. I know what you're saying can get to the point. What does it actually have to do with Rust? This is super abstract. Like, OK, how do I apply this? And this is a very good question, because this is actually about introducing abstractions. And if done right, you end up with code that's easier to reason about. And declarative code in Rust. OK, fine. So as declarative code is um, everything but imperative code, apparently, and Rust is totally able to give you all the imperative needs you ever need to have, uh, you might be wondering, OK, if this is a functional construct, and are you going to talk about functional programming now? And I'm sad to say I'm not, uh, because Rust to me is very pragmatic in that it has functional elements that allows you to write very functional looking code, but it also allows you to embrace mutability and write imperative code if you so desire. And 
I leave it to the experts to say if Rust is actually a functional programming language, but I want to talk to you about how Rust is able to abstract over ideas. And in fact, one of the selling points of Rust is to have uh, zero-cost abstractions, which basically talks about the runtime cost of having abstractions. That means you can write abstract high-level code, and if you need it to be high-performance code as well, you don't have to drop down to a lower level and write it in imperative style instead. Rust tries to give you high-performance code with high abstraction. And this talk will be by example, because it's a short talk and I've also been talking for six minutes already, and I can't possibly give you a recipe to turn all your code into better code, at least not in this talk, and I hope to give you some examples that inspire you. So, let's start with something simple. Let's start with loops. In every piece of code I've ever touched, <coughs> at some point there was a loop over a collection of items. And this looks like a good example to me. Let's have a list of items. I'm going with Latin here because we are in Rome and Fubar is so over. Uh, and the idea is to find the first element that ends with the character M. So we loop over our vector and we go from the zeros item up to the last item, it's defined by the length of the vector, and if the item happens to end with an M, return sum and the content of the element, otherwise return none. Okay, this is simple enough, it's actually easy to read, and if you're used to this style, it's very, very common, and you wouldn't question it. But in the real world, we're gonna have some problems for example, there are new requirements that just happened to turn up one day. Imagine you're going into the office Monday morning and your boss tells you, okay, you've been doing this code, it's fine, it's working, but now you need to have something that finds the, fifths, fi the five elements that end with M. So you're going to extend this piece of code and you add a mutable result to it and you push items into it, and also you try to only go up to five elements, so this if is pretty much twice the size, and in the end you can return the result. Okay, this is still easy to reason about. It's code that fits on a slide, so I'd say it's fine, you can read it and you know what's going on, but there are some nuances. For example, the very important piece is the five, and the less than or equal. And actually the font I chose has a ligature for it, so it's actually a less than or equal sign, but in your code it might not look like this. And the five right in the middle is basically the new requirement, but for some reason it's right in the middle and not just visible. Okay, okay. What's an alternative approach? An alternative approach is to use iterators. And if you've written Rust, you've probably also come across iterators because in Rust they're very common. And the advantage of this snippet of code is that the core concepts are right there in the method names. You filter for items that end with an M, you take five of them, and you collect them. I know I've omitted some type annotations, but this will work in the right context. Actually, this is faster than the loop we've just seen. Because the loop I wrote by hand and I totally forgot that after I've already collected five elements, I can just stop and do an early return. Okay, stupid mistake, but it's Monday morning, right? I totally forgot about it and this code just is way slower than I actually needed to have it. See? You just pointed out a thing. <laughs> so for the live stream, he pointed out that I'm taking six elements because I'm not able to count. But, like I said, Monday morning, this is a great example of how iterators can save me because I don't have to count. I can just like, take five elements and it's good to go. Yeah. Nice. Okay, okay. <laughs> Wasn't actually expecting that. Cool. But 
what, what have we done in general? We have abstracted over this control flow of looping and conditioning and basically just declared our intent on filtering and taking five elements. Also note that this is an abstraction that is pretty, pretty powerful. I have omitted the type annotations for one reason specifically, and that is I don't care that this is a vector and I don't care what I'm collecting into. This could be hash sets. I don't mind. It's super generic, actually. And this makes sense if you have a chain of iterator calls and it's all good, but it also makes sense if you are looking for just one condition in an iteration. For example, there is an any method that you can use to just check, hey, is there any element in my list? And you don't have to write a for loop, and you don't have to write a condition in it. You can just say any, because what you want is to check if there's any element. It's very, very expressive. OK, that's it for iterators. Let's look at another example. And this is about parsing JSON. Because JSON is a very simple format, you could say, OK, I don't have to do any complicated things, uh, maybe? I don't know. So you know there is 30 JSON, and you know it has a value type, and you know if I have a string that looks like JSON, I hope this is formatted correctly, uh, I can get a value out of it, probably. And if there is some value A that happens to be a number, I can print it. OK, easy enough. But next Monday arrives, next requirements arrive, and actually, Yes, this structure actually has three fields, and we need to deal with this, and of course, this is Rust, we know, we can write data types, so we write our structure called response and say this has three fields. And so we continue to write our code as we've been doing it for the last week, and the difference is that it got a bit longer. Yeah. And it's basically all the same. The only thing that changes is this character. And then we have our response. Easy enough, right? But a bit boring. OK, this looks like it's pretty, pretty repetitive and not specific to the actual problem we have, that is dealing with our response. Ross gives us a very neat feature, and that is procedural macros, and especially derive macros. So as you may have seen in 30 code, you can just say derive deserialize, and all this boilerplate code, this repetitive piece of code that we've just seen, gets generated. And in fact, this is same as a loop, also faster, because there is no value that needs to be allocated and filled with generic JSON data, and it even has better errors too. Okay, a bit of a pet peeve of mine this year has been uh, command line applications. So I couldn't go without writing or talking about uh, command line arguments, the core concept. And so imagine you have a program that is named tool for some reason, because I'm bad at coming up with project names, apparently. And it takes an input file name and an output file name, and it does some weird stuff with this file and write it to the output. Cool. That's easy. Using the standard library, I can just say std env args and I get an iterator over my command line arguments. The first one, actually this is wrong. I just realized the first one is actually the name tool. But never mind. Uh, the first one in this case, in this very specific case, where std env works differently, is the input. And the next one is the output. Cool. You may have seen this pattern. Um, that I'm now going to tell you that there are new requirements. And the requirement is that this is not how command line tools should work. They should also take flags like dash "-o", to specify the output file. But don't worry. There's a crate for that. It's called getOpts, and it allows you to write some easy enough code so you can specify an opt opt, whatever that is. An option, option, I don't know, but it's on opt. And it's called O, and it sets the output file name. This is 
from the documentation. I'm not kidding. And it's okay, it works for this specific case, and it's not that much code. I tease a bit with the scrolling, but it's, it's okay, you can do this. So we may have to ask ourselves, how much do I need to read? It's okay. How much do you need to write to make a change? Actually, this create get opts has a nice abstraction. You can write many of those opt opts and opt opt thingies, and you can basically build up your command line to it. But how easy is it to reason about what's actually happening there? I don't know. It's a bit, it's not very expressive, but okay, let's look at another crate that also implements an abstraction over command line arguments, which is called clap, and you may have heard of it. It gives you the possibility to write down what your application should look like, basically. It's, there is a type called app, there's a type called arg, and you can compose an app with arguments. This also includes documentation and is very, very expressive because all these methods allow you to express precisely what you want your application to look like. Very nice. If you run this with dash dash help, you get a nice help message. If you run it with dash dash version, you get a version number. This is abstracted away for you because it's always the same and you don't have to write this code by yourself. But this too has one bit of an issue, and that is similar to our JSON case before. Now we are looking at some values of our arguments, and we are going to deal with the data inside, and we have to do this by ourselves. Hmm, interesting. Maybe we can do something similar to what Sodi did. And yeah, we can, because isn't command line arguments just a data structure too? In fact, there is a library called structop, which you may have also heard of, and it allows you to describe your command line arguments as a structure and derive basically all the code we've seen before, including using the doc comments for help messages. Okay, okay, I've talked quite a lot about procedural macros and derived macros, but I also want to touch on another subject, because this is not a talk about macros, even though it may seem like it. This is a talk about abstraction, and this requires me to use a scary-looking headline, I guess, uh, to make this crescendo of increasing complexity in examples uh, usable. And what I'm trying to get at is we write generic functions, and our generic functions can use concrete types to declare what the user wants. A very nice example I've recently rediscovered, so to say, is uh, in web frameworks. I know there are many web frameworks out there for Rust, but uh, let's imagine there is a very, very generic one, a very, very simple one, not generic in this case, and it's a framework where you specify a function that takes a request and returns a response, simply enough. And our request happens to contain a body of JSON data and we want to get a name field out. This looks like basically the same code we've seen in an earlier example, except that we're also choosing the name nobody if there is nobody. Okay, so this is actually already quite good. But you might be wondering if we've previously managed to get rid of this JSON value, maybe we can get rid of it in this case too. And actually we can go one step further because the request body doesn't have to be JSON formatted at all. And that we are taking the request body and dealing with it as if it were JSON is something that we spent two lines about and actually maybe also a third line. Uh, but 
we don't have to because our generic function could not only take a request but maybe also some other type that tells us what we actually want from our request. And the idea is that this JSON type here is a type that implements, for example, a trait called from request. And when our framework calls it, it gives it a request. And the type says, OK, this request, I'm going to pass as JSON. And the login data type defines what kind of structure we want this JSON to pass into. This allows you to express what data you want extracted from the request without having to do it yourself. And this also composes quite nicely because you can say, I now have a type that is JSON or form data, or I can have a type that's actually a tuple of a query string and a JSON part and maybe also the path of the URL. This is something we should use more often. This is it for examples, but there is one more quite important topic I want to touch on, and that is please be aware of the magic bidet of your code base. And it turns out that any sufficiently high abstraction is indistinguishable from magic. <laughs> yeah, and the next slide is... No, 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 I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> No, I'm not going to touch on that. So sorry. <laughs> Let, let's talk about what magic is, actually, in the scientific sense, of course. And let's define magic as code whose behavior is hard to predict. Or to remember, because at least I am very forgetful. Like, if you show me code and say, I have written this like half a year ago, I will have no idea what this is about. So. Maybe it's also a good idea to write code that is so expressive that you don't have to remember it to make sense. OK, so what code could be hard to predict? Unfamiliar macros, obviously. People are, a lot of people are actually very fearful of using macros because they are magic. This is a quote. Also, very generic code. And there are programming languages that say, OK, it's a good idea to have generics, but actually not in our use case. And that is a very, very solid argument. Because if you want to have predictable code that is easy to read, that may not be as concise as you want it to be, but that is easy to understand, generics will probably hinder this. But also, like, we've all been there. Like, we have tried to write clever code. But could you understand the clever code afterwards? This is also magic. And you can turn magic into science if you have the right tools. For example, something like Cargo Expand will give you the output of what Rust C will actually compile if it has expanded all your macros. So, for example, this struct up example I gave, you can paste it into your editor, run Cargo Expand, and see how it generates clap code underneath. Codes that you didn't have to write, but codes that will be there and codes that you can read if you want to. Sadly, even the best tools will only move this complexity towards using the tool, but not actually resolve this. So, I was wondering, how can we be aware of this? How can we come up with good ideas to write even more declarative and even more expressive and even more useful code. And the next question, obviously, is how can we teach this? How can we get a community to the point where using iterators is so commonplace that you don't question it? How can we use macros in a non-magical sense because there are macros like VEC did you, did you see I used the VEC macro? No, it doesn't really matter, because it's very expressive. You know the type is called VEC, the macro is called VEC, and you expect it to generate a vector. This just works. And so how can we actually teach this? 
So, several approaches. The first one is through interactive learning. Yeah, no, it's the first. This is an ambitious one at first. I'm so sorry, but I really like Clippy Lint, and I know there is a lot of potential for writing even more Clippy Lint. For example, there is one issue that happened to be open by me uh, about linting for loops to suggest iterators. For example, this um, code snippet that uses any could have been a for loop with an if statement and a return. Clippy could detect this and tell you, hey, if you want to write this in a more, maybe idiomatic, but certainly more concise way, use not any. There's a lot of opportunity to teach these aspects of Rust while you're programming. Because lints run, or you can run, you have to do it manually, but you can run your lints basically the second after you've written a line of code. And if you then get feedback about how to improve it, you already know what you want to accomplish, you see what's possible, and I believe this will give you some kind of superpower to learn while you're going without actually having to have the person next to you pointing it out. Like there was this quote that Ross C is a very good pair programmer, and Ross C with Clippy is even more amazing. Okay, this is the first idea. The second idea is a bit more, let's say, idealistic, because I believe that we can write libraries that provide easy to use abstractions. We've seen some libraries, I believe all the libraries I've shown provide some good abstractions. And I believe we can go further in this direction and write libraries that introduce new abstractions, but that are not totally magical to every new user. This also includes resolving any magically looking stuff to write a good documentation, of course. And last but not least, uh, maybe we can give introductory talks on it. Hi. <laughs> this is what I'm doing. Yeah. And I hope this was a good introductory talk on the cloud programming, at least in the sense that I believe the cloud programming to be in Rust. And I hope you got some inspiration from it, or at least some ideas on how to approach and maybe do something differently in your own code base or when you're writing code. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Are there questions to Pascal? Do you think there is a conflict between declarative programming and the performance and memory consumption? If I understood correctly, you're asking about the performance implications of using declarative programming styles? Yes. Okay. Well, it depends on what you're doing, of course. For example, all the examples I showed using 30 and using iterators were actually faster because they did less work. But writing this code manually in an imperative style would be very tedious. You can, of course, do it. And because on an assembly level, everything is imperative, you can optimize every program at an imperative level more rigorously than you would be able to if you have to trust some abstraction. But I believe, especially in Rust, we've managed to come up with some very good abstractions that boil down to being the exact same assembly as an imperative style. For example, using iterators. Any more questions? It seems to me that sometimes declarative programming would almost require some additional magic. For example, when you did the take five and collect, you know, it's sort of, 
it, it does say what to do and not how to do it, but it's not sort of obvious what the resulting performance characteristics might be because you don't know how it accomplishes that task. How do you... Um, about performance too. <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, the resulting uh, performance, you have to measure it to be very, very certain, of course. But it happens to be that lazy iterators are very fast. So in this case, you will find that it's actually the same performance as writing a for loop. And of course, in the end, you have to trust it or you have to measure it. I'd always err on the side of measuring it, but this magic you're talking about to make this fast is called Rust-C and we're always already using it. So, yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Over there. Thank you for your talk. Um, uh, you mentioned that sometimes you look at your old code and you wonder what you did there. Um, what are the measure? What do you do then? Do you leave it like that, or do you start rewriting it, or are you putting memos for yourself, for your future self? Um, do this better next time. It's a very good question. So depends on when I wrote the code. <laughs> I started writing good commit messages at some point where I realized that I couldn't remember what I wanted to do. So I look at my commit messages and say, oh, yeah, is this what's, what? Okay, it works some of the time, but you're right. Basically, I have to read it, I have to understand it, and I have to guess. And this is the same for my own code as for everyone else's making better guesses and being more confident that these guesses about the expected behavior are what you wanted to have is one of the advantages of having declarative code, in my opinion. But also write good commit messages. All right. Then uh, thank you again, Pascal. Yeah. Have a great lunch. <laughs>